happening to them. So it's just to make you aware that weird stuff does appear to happen even to the people who are out there making them, you know, that admit to making them. Now, um, this, this one that somebody sent me this, this is all two or three years ago, probably four years ago, somebody sent me this. Uh, this is a very interesting fellow, uh, Jack Valet. He's, he's actually uh, a UFO investigator primarily. Um, if anyone's seen the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, the character of Lacan is a French guy who does all the, uh, you know, the hand signal, he does all that. Uh, the French character Lacan is based on Jacques Vallée, apparently, that's, that's who he's based on. Uh, and he's, he hasn't really spoken, he used to speak about UFOs very regularly, and then he stopped, I think, uh, I don't know, mid-90s or something, he, wouldn't, he just wouldn't have good interviews or anything. But then in about 2006, he came out of hiding and started talking about stuff again. But anyway, he uh, has written this article, I've got the link here, you can't read it, but it's on the, uh, you know, you can go and read it. Crop circle, signs from above or human artifacts, Jacques Vallée states, the early formation of the simple circles, then circles with satellites, as we've more or less seen, as I've shown you so far. Um, all the significant formations were observed in an area in close proximity to major research facilities of the British Defence Establishment. How strange is that? Often in controlled airspace. Hold replay anybody? Mm. Mm. These studies point to the crop formations as a result of sophisticated electronic warfare experiments conducted by defense contractors. Mm. If you are trying to calibrate a beam, drawing a pattern on a wheat field can yield precision information within the diameter of one stalk over hundreds of feet, an ideal test situation. Mm. Very interesting, Jack. Jack Spelle is one of these people, when he starts to listen to him, this guy knows more than he's laying on. I'm sure he does. You know, you're not quite sure if he's trying to divert your attention slightly. Sooner or, sooner or later, the truth will be known, and it can be used to discredit the community of paranormal researchers who have brushed to decipher alien scripts in the formations or have hypothesized a return of the Druids, Earth lights, or messages from Gaia without first testing the basic physics of the situation, which we're going to talk a bit more about soon. It may also be that such hypotheses have been coldly planted among the New Age milieu as part of a psychological warfare experiment, and that the real nature of crop formations can thus be hidden from serious attention for a very long time. So it's worth just pausing on this and thinking about what he's actually saying has been coldly planted among the New Age milieu as part of a psychological warfare experiment. 2012, anyone? We'll come back to this, but... And that the real nature of the crop formations is thus hidden from serious attention. So what he's saying is that... What he's essentially saying there is, look, somebody's making these crop formations with technology, but there is also other crop formations which are being made by some other agency, which, you know, that's why we have to make these other ones, the Black Ops people. Uh, and basically, I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I'll just got a clip from Freddie Silver again, but I like Freddie Silver. Do you know if our government has looked at the coordinates where crop formations occur and have monitored them being made by whatever these forces are that are making them? Mm, uh, boy, wouldn't I like to be a fly on the wall in the halls of government to find out the answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, they might have incredible pictures that they're holding back on us. Um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, no, no familiar connection, I think, uh, Jonathan Sherwood actually mentioned this while we were having a little quiet pint in a pub, because one of the, um, he mentioned the fact, uh, the very point that you're making, George, the fact that, uh, yes, they do have uh, very advanced uh, uh, technology, most of which we are totally unaware of, because, I mean, a government works in secrecy, as we know, so we're always working 10, 20 years behind them. That's a given fact. Given the technology, there is no doubt that they will be the first people to track the, any kind of blip on the, on the radar, because if the, uh, electro, the, the, if the crop circles are electromagnetic and sonic by nature, which we know they are because they're leaving certain physiological imprints in, on the, in the soil and in the plants, then obviously they'll be tracked well before any person uh, was able to spot them on the ground. And I was very fortunate to have uh, talked to a couple of farmers in Hampshire in England, 
um, about this. Uh, in, actually, in fact, if memory serves me correct, they volunteered the information because they were telling me about one incident in, uh, in England in 1998 when um, they heard some very unusual sounds coming from their fields at about 4.30 in the morning. And all their farm animals were behaving in a very agitated manner, in fact, including the, uh, the, the cat and the dog who tried to jump through a window, and the farmer said, they never do that. They're the most placid creatures you'll ever find. So he thought he might be having burglars or something, or, or foxes. So he went out into the field and um, in the middle of the morning, and at that time in the morning, you can just about see something. It's, it gets light very early at uh, that time in England. And uh, the first thing he sees is a brand new imprint in the middle of his barley field and a, a very large Chinook helicopter, military helicopter, uh, basically on top of it, um, taking photographs, reconnoitering it, uh, bri- the, the whole thing bristling with high sensitive equipment. So we know that they are definitely the first people on the scene of a crop circle. So it makes you wonder, what on earth are they tracking? Yeah, exactly. There's something, but I, I've got to believe they've got something. They've seen it. They've seen them being created, and they're probably just as baffled as we are right now. I think they are, and I think it goes back to the uh, the whole idea, the concept of fear that uh, they're trying to basically put for the whole uh, hoax angle, uh, in order that they can try and study the, the phenomenon before we do, so that they try and control it perhaps, and somehow use it against us. But I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think we're working with much more. Uh, uh, more honest principles, I think, uh, in that respect. And I think there'll always be a, a gap behind the rest of the research field because we are working uh, with much more honorable principles in bringing this out to the public. Okay, um, now to sort of latch on to that, what Freddie Silver was basically pointing out there is these instances where things like black helicopters have been seen over crop circles and military involvement. And it actually goes much deeper than most people realize. This is, this is Colin Andrews. Uh, I think I'll play the second clip rather than the, uh, the, the first one. Now, he was an electrical engineer by profession and a senior officer in the British regional government. For three years, Colin advised the British government on the crop circle phenomenon, supplying technical and scientific reports to the Under Secretary of State for the Environment, the Right Honourable Nic- Nicholas Ridley, MP, in the Margaret Thatcher government. As a result of his persistence, the subject was raised in the House of Commons. Andrews supervised the largest surveillance project of its kind during 1990, called Operation Blackbird. It was an effort uh, to film a crop circle forming, backed and supported by the British Army. Why on earth would the Army be interested in crop circles? (coughs) Mm. BBC and Nippon Television, and was watched closely by the international media. And I remember this, maybe a few of you, you you remember this. Um, And they did actually film something as well. It was reported on the news that they filmed something coming down onto the crop at night. In an interview on Paranet, and, uh, uh, he talked about the phenomenon and shared his views on the use of microwave energy for the creation of crop circles. And we've already covered that, so I'm going to play the second one uh, from 2005, and he made uh, revelations about the important event in the Operation Blackbird project, where the formation of the crop circle was actually filmed, okay? but the tape was stolen. You're saying that you sort of had a hunch where these crop circles were going to make themselves. That's right, where they appeared over the okay. years before. You, you filmed you filmed these crop circles. No human was there in the field making these. They That's were right. somehow made. And this film was stolen by someone. It was removed. It was removed, and, and a blank tape was inserted. No, instead. it was not a blank tape. A tape the tape that was given into the system as, as for analysis was from the same camera position as the one that captured the event, but it was filmed several nights before. In other words, it was known to have the same topography, the same landscape, but it had a different event. Okay, I'm not understanding really why this was important. First of all, if, if you were filming for the first time the self uh, formation of a crop circle. Why? Why would anybody submit? You know, replace that tape. But if it was taken from the same angle, what was different between the original and the replacement? What was different between the original and the replacement? The replacement showed nothing happening. In other words, it showed a night when nothing happened. 
what happened the night a crop circle formed is it had a crop circle forming on it and that was not intended and people behind this which was totally infiltrated by the, the military we had uniformed military personnel with us on the site as can be seen again on the blackbird cd the the military the government did not intend uh, that material if we were lucky enough to see this form uh, they had enough personnel infiltrated into the organization to remove it. In other words, they did not want the public to see what eyewitnesses have seen. That was one of the reasons we were there at Westbury, was that Ray Barnes, a man walking his dog in 81, supporting the fact that uh, many – I had researched them myself – on that same site. Circles had appeared on that site for many years. That's why one of the reasons we were there. But Ray Barnes saw, witnessed a crop circle form in about 10 seconds, like all the other eyewitnesses around the world. And now here we are, lucky enough to get something on tape, and uh, somebody decides, and that is, it has to be nailed at the feet of the British government, decide we are not going to be seeing this. Uh, that, that's the importance of it. The importance is to put the pressure on the people that need to have the pressure put on them at this time is that this is owned by all of us. This is not anything that it should be suppressed or will be suppressed. So it's sort of like UFOs. A lot of people feel that the government, the United States government in this case, and the British government are suppressing the uh, sightings of UFOs and the information we have. No question about it. And that was uh, Hilly Rose rather than George Lurie, the guy who was doing the interview, so quite confusing. Okay, right, so I think probably we're going to have a break at this point before we go on to the next part and try to tie a few things together. So have a quick tea and certainly. Everyone, welcome to part two, Mr. Andrew Johnson. Great, thank you very much. Uh, James, thank you. Um, okay. Um, one of the things I just wanted to briefly mention um, from the last part of the presentation, if you look at the Circle Makers group, right, I've got a DVD there by Richard Hall, right, and that goes into a bit more detail about the background of some of the Circle Makers group and actually what's hidden on their website. Okay? It's very interesting to look at that, that information to tie in with what I'm going to show you now. Okay, now we're going to look at the crop circles made by some other agencies. Okay? Now, 14th of August 1986, one of the first circles discovered with a concentric ring that again known the swirl signature, which is around 0.25 of a rotation. No stump or board marks or multiple rotations present, and that's pitch copyright from Colin Andrews. Again, if you look at the structure here, you'll see it's got like this smooth and this sort of spiral uh, sort of effect here, and you can see this is 0.25 of a revolution, as Colin Andrews has marked. This is from, again, as I say, from Colin Andrews' analysis. So there's no stumper board mark present in this. So this looks like it's been made by some other different kind of agency. And this, again, is 86, so we're looking at a fairly simple formation. And I'm going to be coming back to this as well. This is another interesting aspect which people don't often talk about with the crop circles. Ghost formations. 2003 formations are still visible in 2004 early crops. These are photos by Bussey Taylor, who's done a great job in documenting a lot of these crop circles. This seems to be more evidence that gore stomping would not cause to appear. Why should we get this effect in the crop just from, you know, sort of fairly light pressure being applied to the crop? It doesn't make any sense. I think I've got an explanation for this as well. Um, yeah, so let's just have a look at a couple of uh, eyewitnesses to the formations. Uh, I think there are witnesses at camps. We heard one with Chapin Alton Barnes in 1881 saying he saw one form in 10 seconds. Um, yeah. Ed Sherwood described an incident in 1992. I'll just play this second one, I think, uh, about the walls of plasma, which seem to have some role to play in this as well. Have you ever seen a crop circle develop right under your nose? Not right under my nose, but from a distance. And, uh, and this would bring us on to our next picture, uh, uh, number six, of a, of a orange ball plasma, small <laughs> helicopters that go to intercept them. And I've seen one from a distance create a crop circle formation. And, you know, there's many things that would, would differentiate it. Yeah. These plasmas also uh, do appear worldwide, and they're, they're known in a lot of different areas. Um, like in uh, the Hestelin Valley of Norway, they've been studying, there's been a project studying uh, plasmas like this for over 20 years, and they're 
areas like the Brown Mountain Lights in North Carolina, um, gosh, Lake Ontario, oh, Canada. Sure. They're, they're they're worldwide, they, they appear worldwide, and they just have different regional names. They have the Min Min Lights in Australia, many places um, worldwide where geophysically, you know, there need to be certain conditions where they you know, are able to manifest. But this particular one, uh, image seven, um, I asked it on camera with two other witnesses if it could show us that it was aware of our presence by either moving dramatically, uh, changing form, um, and, in, and or increasing in brightness. And within seconds, it did all three. And it was four miles from us. So it showed that there was absolutely no distance whatsoever between the consciousness of the observer making that request and the ball plasma four miles away responding to it. And the request and the reaction almost instant, I would guess. They were very, very quick. And the previous one, image six, um, uh, um, a month after that, that happened, a month after the, the woman photographed this, asking first, because she asked me how to photograph ball plasma, I said, well, well, ask first, you know, um, and she went up a hill, disappeared over the hill, and her car stalled, and this ball of light rose up behind the hedge, and she asked first, she had the presence of mind to ask, and, and it just sat there and let her roll off a whole load of film. Now, the plasma, does it uh, make the crop formation, or does it just happen to be there when these are going on? No, I don't, neither. neither. Um, I feel that the ball plasmas are part of the creative process. All right. They may be there, they may not be there. They may be there but not visible. They may um, uh, be in the vicinity. Um, I've witnessed more than 100 ball plasmas in the last 15 years, and I only saw one create a crop circle from a distance. So he's basically just bringing in this idea of balls of plasma, which many witnesses have called. He's not really sure exactly what those, those balls of plasma are doing. Sometimes they just seem to be observing, and he said there at the end, it only once did he think it was involved in the formation of the crop circle. So, you know, who knows? Um, now, one of the things which was uh, uh, featured in a Discovery Channel documentary was this. This is a mock book. We haven't got a video of this, unfortunately. But Nancy Tolbert, who of BLT Research, and Robert van der Broek witnessed a beam of light in Hoven in Holland in early morning of 2001, uh, 21st of August 2001. At 3.15am, an intense white column or a tube of light about 8 inches to 1 foot in diameter flashed down from the sky to the ground, illuminating my bedroom and the sky as brilliantly as if from helicopter searchlights. The entire display took 5 to 6 seconds. If the boarding cattle are considered to be part of this situation, the total time would be about 10 minutes. In a few seconds, a third tube of light also flashed down to the ground. Robert saw only two tubes of light. Later that night, Robert reported that he had heard the dog next door barking furiously just prior to the appearance of the light tubes. And then I believe the next day they actually saw this formation in the field. So they actually witnessed this happening. And Nancy Tolbert, she um, gave this account in full to the Discovery Channel documentary and uh, they didn't even put it in. They wouldn't put it in the documentary. Uh, now another one that's on the BLT research, this is another very interesting case. And this is from uh, July 21st, 22nd, 2000. Duration was approximately seven minutes. 12:15 um, a.m. It was uh, midnight, basically. Brilliant, brilliant red, slowly moving object with rotating white fog-like material inside as it came across the road and over the field. Uh, this was a drawing by the witness, uh, Jace uh, Sablecki. I'm not I'm sure how to pronounce that. Illustrating the object as it was touching down with extended bluish arms tipped with brilliant violet coloured lights on the ends. Uh, and this is what he's drawn. And this was the formation that was, that was left. So quite a complicated one. I think these arrows are showing the direction of the swirl as if it's been created by some vortex of energy. And then you've got these lines between. So again, it's not, you know, it's not a hugely complicated formation, but it was in the field, you know, underneath where this object flew over. And this is what the witnesses say. So um, this was also uh, reproduced a, a year later in the same spot, with just a slightly different formation, I think, with just some small variations in this. It's a similar formation, but it's reproduced in the same spot, but you've got this square within this one, and then a sort of circle in the middle. But it's superficially a similar formation, um, but overall uh, in the same spot. Very, very peculiar. Now, I think it's this next one, which is one of the most peculiar things I've ever come across. Now, I've got this slide as a dyslexic ET, because you'll see from the, from the bottom. 
And the village of Lublin, in southeastern Poland, about 400 kilometers from Walatuo, Mr. Robert Zamuda was fishing for his dinner and caught a large carp like fish. He discovered a peculiar marking literally embedded in the skin on both sides of the animal. He photographed the carp prior to dispatching this to his dinner table. <laughs> Isn't this bizarre? It's a pattern. And I've found that it's an example of a carp circle. <laughs> With a dyslexic uh, ET that was involved in doing this. So they didn't quite understand the lingo and identify the correct uh, thing to make the circle in. But you can see it's a very similar design here to the one that's in this, uh, in this circle here. And not, I think it wasn't far away, it was only yeah, 400 kilometres away. So, you know, very strange, very strange type of thing. Now, this is uh, somebody who was talking to me about this video in the interview, but not very good quality. Um, this is a video of crop circle formation with the balls of light. I think this will loop and you'll see it sort of go around again. Um, it's quite a controversial video. Some say it's an outright hoax. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Oliver's Castle video. You can see there's a sort of couple of edits in the film. And it was reported to have been sourced through a TV production company. That's why it's regarded yeah. as suspicious. Um, now, I couldn't find a conclusive analysis, analysis which proved the fakery, but an analysis by Paul Vide came close. But I'm not sure if this was this video or another similar one when I actually read this analysis. Paul Vigo was found dead uh, last year. Apparent suicide washed on the beach. I met him in 2006, yep. Yeah. Yeah, he had a website about 9 11 as well as about crop still, still under investigation, that apparently, but uh, the, in the inquest uh, seemed to suggest it was, a, it was a suicide, but very peculiar. And um, we'll probably see that clip again shortly. Now there's a big, I know there's a lot more people have looked into it. You know, I haven't really touched on the symbolism that much. I'm not big into the symbolism. I'm trying to look at the sort of uh, things like some of the scientific uh, evidence that's been gathered. Uh, the symbolism is a whole different story, really, which other people can cover a lot better than I can. Um, but you know, you, you, we've had ones like this which are just amazing, really. When you look at the sort of symmetry, uh, we've got these swallows flying over. Some people have suggested that these are like symbolic of chemtrails, you know, the stuff coming out of the back. Um, you know, other people have made other suggestions. I mean, I, I, know, I just don't know. I mean, I think it's a pretty amazing formation, and uh, artistically, it's very interesting. You know, it's not just somebody, some thought has gone into making that. Now, this one is particularly interesting. This, this is a, spoken a lot of by um, Ed and Chris Sherwood, who are very good researchers, I think. And, and Chris Sherwood has written an article outlining the high strangeness of crop circles which appeared around the time of the Shoemaker Levy 9 Jupiter uh, uh, crop circle. And it's the impact of Shoemaker Levy 9. Let's see, uh, did I put it in the thing? You can see this is a grainy clip. I think, I think it's from the Hubble Space Telescope. It may be a ground based telescope, I'm not sure. But you can see this white flash here. This is. Fragment of comet Shoemaker Levy 9 impacting into Jupiter's atmosphere in 1994. And it's, this is filmed in the infrared, so this is the heat flash from this huge explosion that's sort of bigger than the size of the Earth. You know, it's half a billion miles away, so obviously Jupiter's, I don't know, 11 diameters of the Earth wide or something, I think Jupiter is. Um, and, and then when the uh, globe of Jupiter turned around a few hours later, this was what was left. You've got this crescent sort of shape here. Sort of crescent here and two blotches here in the middle, and, uh, and then this, this, this blob here. Uh, and in the glyph, the shapes of the letters O and C, and that's Oliver's Castle. So you can see the O here and the O and the C. And also, um, this I think was nine days after the impact, and there are nine circles in this formation. Uh, and it's to, it all ties in with this constellation of Corpio. Chris Sherwood has also pointed out connections to the constellation of Scorpio over the time of this event. And it's the Scorpio Sour. If you look at the article, you'll see this, it's on their, on their website. Um, but they maintain that all the crop circles since 2001 are man-made. They don't really explain all of that. I'm not entirely convinced by that statement myself, but uh, they, that's what they believe. But this, this is very, very interesting how this, this image, which wasn't released until I think it happened in July, this impact was it? 
Yeah, I think it happened on like July the 21st or something, 1994. But the image wasn't released until November, for some reason. I'm not sure why they didn't release this, this image. Very peculiar. And that's what Ed Sherwood apparently uh, maintained. But of course, this was only when the internet was in its infancy. So, you know, we would have had to filter through the papers and the newspapers pretty much. Obviously, we had the uh, basic internet in the sort of early 90s, but I certainly didn't get the internet in my house until 1997, I think. So, um, it would have taken you a day to download it. Well, exactly, yeah, you know, <laughs> Mr. Bell from 2400 Bowes Road, So, very, very interesting that you've got this correspondence between an event out there in the solar system and something on the ground. That is really interesting, and I think it's one of these things you cannot, I mean, I can't dismiss that as a coincidence. Maybe some people in the room can, I don't know, but I can't. You know, I really can't. Very interesting. You can read that article for a bit more information. Now then, this is where we get a bit more interesting as well because of this Mayan symbolism. Now, when I first saw this, I was thinking, wow, you know, this is amazing. You know, you've got all these flipping circles here and there's all this complicated analysis of, you know, one, I think this was another one that was revisited when it was done, it was made, and then a day later, some of these little twiddly bits were all filled in. Uh, and what they were saying is that they were making adjustments, if you count all these number of sticks and the number of spirals and all this, you know, again, I'm not big into this, but it was meant to be specifying dates, significant dates in the Mayan calendar. It's all laid, apparently it's all laid out in this crop circle. You know, and you can see it's a very, very complicated design. Very complicated. And it's huge as well. Let's see, have I got the measurements on it? I think this is about 400 feet across. And of course, there's Silvery Hill, right, right in the distance there. Um, so, you know, we're getting all this Mayan symbolism. But this has only started, I think, since about 2001, 2003. So let's just say, you know, I say to people, let's say the aliens are making these crop circles. I mean, you know, are the aliens all Mayans? You know, do they only think we understand the Mayan calendar? I mean, I, I don't understand it. You know, I mean, I've studied it a little bit, but I know there's all these, like Jeff Stray and all these other guys and flipping experts on it. I don't understand it. But why, why would they choose that? I don't know, it's all a bit strange. And again, another one. 2012. Sorry? 2012. Apparently so. Apparently so. But what are we being sucked into? Is what, I'd, what I'd ask. Right. So we've got another one. This is all mine and symbolism. Again, you know, you can analyse it and all these numbers and columns and dots are in specific places. Very, very complicated. And it has been decoded. You know, all this symbolism. And it's, it's, it's a different language. Now, I don't speak this language, some people can decode it, I can't. 320 feet in diameter, 2005, August 9th, Wayland Smithy, Wiltshire again. Uh, photo by Steve Alexander. Central crescent shape is said to represent the sun, and the other features relate to dates in the Mayan calendar, which we basically just said. And there's been quite a few of these now, we've had another one this year, which I'll come to later. Uh, 350 feet in diameter, uh, reported August 13th, 2005, at Woolstone Hill, not far from Uffington, Oxfordshire. So again, all these Mayan dates are encoded in these, this, this formation, apparently, uh, from what I understand. Now then, now we go to something different. Yes, but basically, uh, I've got a video clip uh, talking about this in a second. I'm not going to bother with the audio clip, I think the video clip is better. But the set, when this appeared, we've got these two formations. We've got the face on Mars, and we've got this reply to the message, 70, 1974 hour receiver message. SETI, the Search for extra, Extraterrestrial Intelligence, they basically just said that they debunked this. Um, let's see. This is highly improbable. There is no evidence to suggest that any other, earthly, other than earthly origin for these graphics. Some of the reasons why we are sceptical that this signal came from the far as follows. Well, they basically debunked it. I'm not going to read it all out. I think. What I want them to tell me, SETI can say this can't be made by aliens or whatever. I don't know what it's made by, but... They need to explain how it was made. They need to reproduce it somehow, or specifically describe the method by which it was made. You see how complicated it was. Uh, yeah, this is in the video clip. I'm not going to read all that out, so we'll go into the video clip. UFOs, our extraterrestrial past, the cosmic plan. In the early 70s, there began to appear in the south of England a series of mysterious patterns imprinted on field grains. These markings were referred to as agroglyphs or crop circles. 
They always seem to appear at harvest time and on grain fields. In the Middle Ages, the same phenomenon in harvest fields was recorded. The patterns appeared, and at a the time they were considered to have been made by the devils, by the fairies. They were called fairy circles, and the people were warned that whoever walked inside them ran the risk of disappearing. When these patterns began to show up in the 70s, at first they were simple figures, circles, triangles, and rectangles. When they were just circles, it was first thought it might be a geomagnetic phenomenon, or the result of whirlwinds or small tornadoes. But when the figures started becoming more complex, more beautiful and larger, there was a really a compelling interest in investigating them. This interest increased even more when researchers realized that the spikes of grains were folded, they weren't broken. This was not the mark of a person stepping on them or a violent impact. A subtle force had folded the spikes. There was a strange uh, a sort of mutation in the crystals of the grains, suggesting that a magnetic force or some type of energy had made the figures. It appeared to be a message, a message from the heavens to us here on Earth. In 1996, at Oliver's Castle, a video was made of some illuminated spheres that began to flutter over the harvest fields, and in fractions of seconds, they made an imprint these same type of figures. On August 17, 2001, alongside the Schild Bolton radio telescope, there appeared a set of two figures, initially a gigantic three-dimensional phase. At ground level, there was nothing visible that would make us believe that this was a phase. These were just little piles of weed. But that phase is not unknown. It is identical to the phase of Sidonia on Mars, a phase that was discovered on a mountain on the surface of that planet. And what is the other figure? A rectangular figure that turns out to be the answer to a message that was sent from Earth on November 16, 1974. Frank Drake, a friend of Carl Sagan, using the big radio telescope of Arecibo, Puerto Rico, had sent a radio signal into space to M13, the great nebula of Hercules, located 24,000 light years away. He hoped that at some time some intelligent civilization would receive it and would respond. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, almost 300,000 kilometers per second. That radio wave would take 24,000 years to get there. And if there had been an answer, it would have taken 48,000 years to receive the reply. Who would be here on Earth to receive the answer? Nevertheless, the answer didn't take 48,000 years, but only 27 years. And not through radio waves, but through imprints on fields of grain. From the figure, it can be seen clearly that these beings are familiar with the elements of communications that exist here on Earth. In this case, the universal language of numbers, of mathematics. They also knew our components of life. According to the genetic code, there are variations on the father's side. It is mutated or changed. This suggests that they are a sort of transgenic beings, or we are a variation to them. The average height of these beings, at least the ones that appear in this design, is 120 centimeters, small with a big head, like many similar beings that have been observed in different parts of our world. In terms of location in their solar system, counting from their sun, they would be occupying the third and fourth orbits in the moons of the fifth planet. But if we look very carefully, they have nine planets around their sun, a significant coincidence with our own solar system. Perhaps they are not answering from outside our solar system, but from inside, with bases on Mars, Earth, and the moons of Jupiter. Their means of communications is obviously not a radio telescope. That would be a very primitive form of communication for them. The form, in this case, is the same concentric and tangential circles that appear one year before year 2000 at the same place. This shows that in order to communicate with us, these beings have traveled through time and space, through cosmic folds, through interdimensional fields. They could do this because they master space and time. The fact that many of these figures appearing in fields in the south of England and in more than 25 countries are related to the latest discoveries of science indicate that there is a follow-up a supervision of Earth's projects on their part. There appears to be an interest in helping human beings to remember a great deal of information that is already part of our own genetic code. If we were sold on this planet, all we have to do is remember.
So just a quick summary of that. There was a message sent out by the Arecibo radio telescope and it was encoded in a binary format. And this was a sort of version of it. And that was sent in 1974. In 2002, we get this crop formation in England, which is a response to this message. So that, how was that made? Who made it? Who is it? Who is going to say, let's, let's just say for the sake of argument, it was made by people who were stomping with boards. God knows how they did it, but just think, they're going to be sat in the pub one night, what, should, what crop formation should we make? I know the 1974 hours, I mean, who's heard of that message in this room before now? Uh, right, okay, I mean, a few people have, they are not, not saying, but you see what I mean. Would you actually be able to write down what it actually was and decode it and then think of changing bits of it? I'm tempted to think that this really is a message to us. What this is all about is expanding our consciousness and all of the stuff that's going on right now, everything is to keep your consciousness not expanding. That's why this phenomenon is important. That's why it's important. This is another route to expanded consciousness, the crop circle phenomenon. And that's what I think this is involved with. We've gone from this. Um, that's the, that was, it was right next to the uh, um, radar facility. It's not a radio telescope. Uh, I think that was they were stated incorrectly in the video clip. It's actually on a radar uh, monitoring station. Ah, now then, this is the one. This is the one. Very, very interesting formation indeed. Not a lot of people talk about this formation. Very, very rarely discussed. Very rarely discussed. 300 foot long appeared at Crabble Farm, 14th, 15th of August, 2002. Now, I spoke to Paul Vivier about this, and he's a real expert. He's been out in the crop circles, measured all these electrical fields with this meter that he had that he made and stuff. He was a real expert, not like me, just somebody who sort of, you know, puts a few PowerPoint slides together and tries to give his understanding of it. But Paul Vigay yeah, really looked at this and that and I spoke to him and said, oh, I think it's just a hoax. And I said, why do you think it's a hoax? He said, oh, it's just so different from all the others. I think it must be a hoax. Which to me was, wasn't a very good reason. You know, let's have a look at it. Hmm. Contains a binary encoded message. You can decode it yourself. You know how to do it. You can read it by decoding the sequence of zeros and ones from the inside out, and that's exactly the same way that you read a compact disc or a DVD. If you've ever burned your own DVDs on the computer, if you look at it and you only burn half of one, you'll see that the inner half has got marks and the outer half is blank. Ah, so we can read the message. So what does the message say? Firstly, it's not in Mayan. It's nothing to do with the Mayan calendar. This message is written in English. It's written in ASCII code. The American standards in, uh, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It's written in ASCII code. And the message says, Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, and it, even with these capitals, the capitals are included in the message, I haven't added these. Much pain, but still time. Believe. Full stop. There is good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing, comma. That's exactly what the message says. Now, when this first appeared, it was quickly decoded by somebody. The decoded message was first published on Linda Milton Howe's Earth Files site uh, in 2002. Researcher Morris Osborne and some other people pointed out subtle errors in the original translation of the message. Why would that be, do you think? I think this is quite significant, actually. Osborne's translation basically is this. Where the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises, same for earth files. Much pain but still time, same for earth files. Believe, believe. But the earth files said that was a damaged word and they couldn't decode it. Hmm, very interesting. There is good out there, there is good out there. We oppose deception, we oppose deception. Conduit closing, comma. And theirs was conduit closing, bell sound. Character number seven in the ASCII set, for those that know it. Character ten is carriage return. Character uh, ten is the blind feed rather. Carriage return is character thirteen. And uh, character thirty-two is space. I know that because I'm a software engineer in 20 years. I learned a lot of it by heart. So why these subtle changes? Well, if you think a comma 
implies that the message isn't finished, you know, something else to come. A bell sound was what was used on the old teleprinter systems, and when it went ding, that was the end of the message, and you tore off the paper to read it. So that's the end of the message, that isn't. When was that? That was in 2002. There's been a, there's, there has been another one as well, which I haven't got in this presentation, that was discovered, I think. I can't remember, 2006, 2007, there's another in ASCII encoded message, I haven't had a chance to put it in this presentation, that was, I only found out about it, I think, a few months ago, from Ian and Sam's presentation. So, an English message, as opposed to a Mayan one. Hmm, different language, folks. Why would that be? Would that be made by a board? No, I don't think that was made by a board. That was made by a sophisticated process. I don't know who made it. But what I'm trying to point out is that you're getting different languages in New Seals. To me, it implies that they're coming from different sources. Different sources, yeah. yeah. And it's also, again, you know, let's say, oh, was it a board something? Who's going who's gonna to call up with that? Who's going to call up, you know, oh, let's, fag packing, oh, let's have a look right now. Let's think of a message right now. We'll change some uppercase, lowercase letters. And we'll get the ASCII code and then we'll put it like a, in a spiral format. Why, why is it yeah. Pardon? Why did they choose? Well, exactly. Now, a lot of, a lot of people. Because, it's because England and the English are the leaders of the Anglo Saxon races of people right around the world. Maybe, maybe. But I, I don't know the reason. All I'm just putting out some ideas for you to think about and come to your own conclusions. I don't, I don't have an answer for this part of the, of the question. What I can tell you is some people say, you know, what I can say is, some people say, well, if these aliens are making crop circles, why don't they just say, hello, where are the aliens, in the, in the actual <laughs> English letters in the crop circle? Well, this comes pretty damn close to that, doesn't it? Well, you know, to me, it does. Why, this, is it, why do they do it in crops? Good question, I don't know. What have we got to believe? Well, they scorch it into tarmac. Believe <laughs> there is good out there. Believe there is good out there. Into stone. Ah. That's what he says. Believe. Believe. There is good out there. Believe is a narrow full stop after believe. Mm -hmm. It's as if believe is one, one something different to so there is good out there. Anyway, we could talk about that for hours, the subtleties, the meanings of it. You know, you can go and check that out, you can look at the data. I think that is just that whatever whoever's made it, I think it's just amazing. Very few people will discuss that crop circle, which I find <laughs> bizarre, because that is one of the most amazing crop circles I've ever seen. Has that, has that shaken some of the researchers then? They mostly just ignore it, I think, because it doesn't fit into their picture, right, I don't think. Right, yeah. See, it doesn't fit into 2012, particularly. Yeah, it's, it's English. It, it, you know, it's an alien head with a compact disc. It's not a you know, weird symbol with Masonic yeah. overtones or something. I mean, you know, whatever. It's just a totally off-the-radar map. Maybe that was its function, to judge people. Really? I don't know. You know, I'm just guessing. I don't know. But this is a key thing. She's for head at Crop Circle event, Pat Delgado and Levitation. Now I'm going to get some answers about what's making some of the crop circles. The news events at White Crow occurred on the night of Saturday, Sunday, 17th, 18th, 1989. Six people climbed up Chief's foot head hill, head hill and sat in a crop circle at midnight. I thought I'd like to have an audio of this, but I'm going to have to read this. That's not about that one. Now this is, uh, let's see, that's Colin Andrews, that's Tim Good, the UFO author. And that's Pat Delgado, who just passed away last year, but he was 90 years old. So he was getting on in years. Standing at the southern position with Colin in the crop circle, I was controlled to reach out and sweep energy from the sound into Colin's body. I do not know why. Colin then left me and returned to the group at the top of the crop circle. I turned towards the sound and my arms were being pulled over the crop with even greater force, and my body felt it was being pulled upward and forward out of the circle at some perilous angle. With all the strength I could muster, I managed to withdraw my arms, gradually sink down and turn around so I was now facing north. I eventually laid down on my stomach and began to inch my way up the centre of the sloping uh, circle floor, grabbing at bunches of flattened barley stems and pushing with my knees and feet. My progress was slow because whatever short distance I made forward, a force kept pulling me back half that distance. I was becoming totally exhausted, and at that moment I wondered what I was fighting against. There was nothing tangible, but I was under the control of some force of incredible strength. This, was, this story was only disclosed last year, about a year ago. It was only posted on Colin Andrews' website about a year ago, even though it happened in 1989. For some reason, they didn't want to talk about it. I hung on as best I could. I called out to Colin to come and help me. 
I remember instructing him to come down the eastern edge of the circle and crouch in position, which he did until he was level with me. We inched our way towards each other until we grabbed hands, and it was then that both of us began to be pulled back and downwards. Fighting against this force, we managed to break away from it and crawl to the side of the circle. And still crouching, we quickly worked our way back to the group at the north side. For some minutes, we sat there answering questions as to what had happened, when suddenly some force levitated me to a height just a brushing a flattened crop and floated me to the east side of the circle. This was what caught my attention. Now I was feeling really scared. What force could have moved me a distance of about three metres while still in the same sitting position? It was here that I called to Colin and the others to join me. After a few minutes, we all decided to leave the circle. I bet they I'm not surprised that we've been gone long before that. <laughs> Now, in the same article when Colin Andrews published this last year, he was having a bit of dispute with uh, Nick Pope. Because Nick Pope said, in the, I can't, I can't, this was posted on uh, Nick Pope's website as well, but I couldn't establish the exact date. It's around November or December 2002. This is a quote from Nick Pope. I had to refute, I had to refute, I had to refute the bizarre idea that the formations were caused by the testing of space-based laser or directed energy weapons underlined by me and dispel suggestions that media coverage of the issue had been stifled by the use of denoticers. Why isn't Nick Pope just saying, I disagree with the idea of directed energy weapons being used? Apparently he's on some kind of mission to dispel the notion of directed energy. He's saying he had to do it. Apparently he did. Hmm. Why has somebody told him he had to? I never said that. No, but it sounds like that. I had to. Somebody told me I had to. Now then, I'm starting to get some answers, I think. Yeah, I know where you're going with this <laughs> World Trade Center dust. Mm. Subject to some <clears throat> hot discussion in the 9 11 truth room, which I've somehow found myself, myself at the center of. It was, uh, I should have put the date on this, it's there. I think it was 2007. Professor Stephen E. Jones, you want to cover up about 9 11. He was involved in the cold fusion cover up in 1989. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in my book and whatnot. Ties into the picture of 9 11. Now, he and a few other guys got together and published this paper about the World Trade Center dust. I am Rich Sparroid from the USGS Particle Atlas of World Trade Center dust. That's the, the caption for the picture that's in his paper. It's about 20 microns in diameter. How interesting is that? Steve Jones and his group say that this is a signature of thermite having destroyed the steel in the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. I think not, Mr. Jones. I think this is the signature of the weapon which was used to destroy the World Trade Center, which I've given a whole presentation about and how that's been covered up. Mm -hmm. Levitation effects on mine. Remember Cap Pat Delgado's levitation story? So we've got iron rich microspheres in crop circle soils discovered by WC Levengood in 1999. We've got iron rich spheres discovered in World Trade Center dust of the same size as WC Levengood's. That's a Hutchinson effect creating levitation. It's a car near the World Trade Center. Again, if you've not seen this, you're diving in a bit of a deep end. Yeah. I've got a video clip here, hopefully. Let's see. The South Tower came down. I was across the street, and I picked up the camera just out of habit. And something in the back of my mind said, run, run, run. And never in 20 years of shooting in New York have I run from an assignment. But something in the back of my head just said, run. And as I hit the corner of Liberty Street, um, it was almost being picked up by a tornado, almost being picked it's up like by a wave. It was like being picked up by the black cloud. That black cloud, cloud had substance. Mm. It was like night, but it had yeah. had a solid feel to it. It was like gravel, hot gravel, mm. and just picked me up and tossed me about a block. I just, at one second I was running, and the next second I was airborne. And I, I, I lost my glasses, I lost my cell phone, I lost my pager, but managed to hold on to both cameras. Mm. But it threw you for a block? I was back down at Ground Zero last week and walked the area where 
have a pretty good recollection of where I was and where I wound up, and it was it was just under it was just under a city block. It was this blast of warm air. It wasn't hot. It was warm. And it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building that was... You were picked up off the ground. Physically picked up off the ground. I remember an explosion. At that point, I got knocked out. I don't remember anything. Then I got up, and I looked out the window because the windows exploded, and the street below caved in. 